Welcome to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, the birthplace of Congregational Humanism. We carry on that tradition of free thought today, dedicated to promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. Our web address is firstunitarian.org. I'm David Breeden, Senior Minister. Welcome. Good morning and welcome. It's good to be gathered in one virtual space with one common focus. We're glad you're here. A couple of announcements. After assembly today, we hope you'll plan to join us in our online coffee hour. Watch the chat box for the link for that. And this from the FUS Foundation. Remember that Applications for the Pearson Social Justice Grant are due by November 15th. For more information, you can see our Friday email or check on the FUS website under News. Our theme for November is healing, and oh wow, do we need it. In his book, My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma, and the pathway to mending our hearts and bodies. Author and Minneapolis-based trauma specialist, Resma Menachem says, quote, in today's America, we tend to think of healing as something binary. Either we're broken or we're healed from that brokenness. But that's not how healing operates, and it's almost never how human growth works. More often, healing and growth take place on a continuum with innumerable points between utter brokenness and total health." Close quote. We gather in community to support and witness each other's movement along the continuum of brokenness and health. Even virtually, perhaps especially virtually, in this cultural moment of extreme anxiety and vulnerability, let us rest here in each other's presence. Come, let us assemble together. Hey everybody, Reverend Jim here with our Time for All Ages. Today I want to talk about a cluster of holidays that are all happening this weekend. And the first one I want to talk about is Halloween. As many of you whose bellies are full of candy know, Halloween was celebrated just yesterday. Halloween has been a holiday for a very, very long time, but where the heck did Halloween come from? Did a bunch of kids just decide to start going door to door in search of sugar? That's a pretty good guess, but Halloween's traditions actually were started by a bunch of grown-ups. And to get to the true roots of the holiday, we have to go back at least a couple of thousand years to the ancient Celtic people. They lived in what is now Ireland and other parts of Europe. They celebrated a holiday called Samhain, and that's how it's pronounced, Samhain, even though it may not look like that. Samhain is about halfway between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. It was a time to mark the completion of the harvest season and the beginning of the long dark season, when survival was more difficult and danger and death seemed closer at hand. Samhain was a time when the ancient Celts believed that the spirits of the dead mingled with the living and played tricks on them. This is why we talk about ghosts and goblins so much this time of year. And it was the ancient Celts who started the, tr the tradition of carving pumpkins and illuminating them from the inside with fire. The pumpkin represented the harvest and the fire represented the sun. It was hoped that this practice would bring good luck to preserve the harvested food through the winter. The ancient Celts also used to go place to place giving out token bits of the harvest as a way to keep the wandering spirits happy. This practice was one of the early origins of trick-or-treating. Eventually, Christianity came to the Celtic parts of Europe, and as often happens when two cultures meet each other, the traditions started to blend. The Christians brought their holiday of All Saints Day, and actually moved it to be on the same day as Samhain. In the Catholic religion, a saint is a very good and holy person who has died, 
and tradition holds that dead saints can sometimes help out people who are still living by performing miracles for them. So there was definitely some overlap with the Celtic belief that the dead are still active among the living. The Catholics also brought along All Souls Day, which is on November 2nd. All Souls Day is a day for remembering all those who have died, not just the saints. The Day of the Dead tradition that you may be familiar with, perhaps from the movie Coco, is a version of these holidays and is celebrated in Mexico and by people of Mexican heritage all over the world. Two last questions you might have. Why is it called Halloween? Well, the word hallow means holy, and the een part of Halloween comes from evening or eve. Halloween used to be called All Hallows' Eve, because it was the night before the eve of All Saints' Day, a day celebrating all the holy people. And finally, what about the costumes? Where did those come from? Well, we have to go all the way back to those Celts. About a thousand years ago, once Christianity had arrived, young unmarried men would parade around on Halloween to ask for gifts for the spirits. These young men had a bit of free time because they had worked hard to get the harvest in before any mischievous spirits appeared. And because they were hiding from the spirits, or because they were hiding from the fellow humans that they had been playing pranks on, they wore disguises or costumes. So as you're looking at a, pictures of all your friends in costumes and eating your candy by the glow of your pumpkin, you can be thankful for those ancient Celts, for, for the traditions that many of us still enjoy today. That's our time for all ages this morning, and good wishes to everyone, whichever holidays you observe. First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis is the birthplace of Congregational Humanism. Four FUS ministers were signers of Humanist Manifestos, John Dietrich, Ray Bragg, Corin Arisian, and Kendall Gibbons. For more than a century, FUS has been at the forefront of Unitarian Universalist humanism and the broader humanist movement. Help us keep the voice of First Unitarian Society strong in these troubled times. Each week when we gather, we light our chalice and share one of the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, or one of the aspirations of our congregation. This week we light the chalice remembering our aspiration to live joyfully and ethically, in loving, reverent relationship with humanity and nature. Now for our Congregational Covenant. Love is the spirit of this place, and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hits my eye, something without warning, love, bears heavy on my mind. Then I look at you, and the world's all right with me. Just want to look at you, and I know it's going to be a lovely day. Lovely day, 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 Always seems to know the way. Then I look at you, and the world's all right with me. Oh, just wanna look at you, and I know it's gonna be a lovely day. Lovely day, lovely day, lovely day, 
On Sundays when we gather, we take a few minutes to reflect on the joys, sorrows, and milestones of the human experience. We do this so that we stay in touch with our own humanity. We do this to remind ourselves of the value of a moment of stillness. And we do this so that no one among us is alone, either in celebrating joy or in facing the burdens of life. This morning we have some very sad news to share from FUS member Tom Walsh. Tom's wife, Nancy Walsh, died this past Wednesday after living with bladder cancer during the past five years. Tom and Nancy were married for 49 years, and we extend our condolences to Tom and his family at this time of profound grief. Nancy was a member of Westwood Lutheran Church, which will be coordinating a memorial service at a future date. We offer Tom our companionship and support in the weeks and months ahead. Cards for Tom can be sent to the FUS office. We also have news this morning about FUS member Barbara Blackstone. As some of you may remember, last winter Barbara unexpectedly lost consciousness and fell while shopping. She sustained a head injury and had a slow but successful recovery. Unfortunately, she had a similar fall this past Wednesday and after some surgery is recovering in the hospital. Barbara is very active in our congregation, taking part in the Active Voices Justice Group, the Tuesday Writing Group, the Right Relations team, and more. And we send her our love and support as she continues to heal. Cards for Barbara can be sent to the FUS office. Before we share our moment of silence, we pause to acknowledge the difficult events in our nation this past week. So many basic human rights, from voting to marriage to reproductive health, are newly in jeopardy because of changes to the Supreme Court. And we know this coming week has the potential to create more fear, anger, and anxiety. Please know that even in these times of isolation and distancing, you are not alone. As the election and its potential complications approach, we encourage you to have a plan for whom you are going to check on and who will check on you. Please reach out to your fellow congregants or to your ministry team. Please remember to balance any bad news with activism, respite, and practices that sustain you. And don't forget that there are tens of millions of people like you acting for the greater good. Let us now share a moment of silence. As we come out of the silence, we'll hear a special musical reflection graciously shared by one of our sibling congregations, the First Unitarian Society of Denver. The piece is called Meditation on Breathing by Sarah Dan Jones. Breathe. 
I'm going to separate my talk into two pieces today. The first, the hard look at what I consider to be the facts of the situation. And then this part two, the hopeful part after a little musical interlude. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's easy to feel unsafe right now. The pandemic has dragged on for months and at the moment, it's only getting worse. Personal safety, the safety of loved ones and friends, the discouraging news of the ever rising numbers, and the bungling of those designated to keep us safe. Then there's that fallout from the pandemic, uh, lives disrupted, made more difficult, uh, more restricted and more lonely. Businesses are closing, employment insecurity, the list of things to be worried about stretches on and on. And then there's the American political situation. Here in this country, we don't agree on what we do know, what we don't know, and even how to figure out what we could know. And then, of course, here in Minnesota, to add insult to injury, it's, uh, the winter is coming early. Our theme for the month of November is healing. So as we begin the month, let's keep in mind that whether it's personal or national, the first step in healing is a clear-headed assessment of the wound itself. So uh, that's what I want to do right now is take a look at the wound. You probably know the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's uh, become a cult classic. Uh, one of the most memorable scenes, I guess because it's so absurd and gross, is the scene between King Arthur and the Black Knight. You shall not pass, says the Black Knight. And a sword fight ensues between King Arthur and the Black Knight. First, Arthur cuts off the knight's left arm to which the knight replies, "'Tis but a scratch." And then when Arthur cuts off his right arm, the knight responds, "'It's only a flesh wound.'" 
Arthur then proceeds to cut off the knight's legs, to which the knight eventually concedes. We'll call it a draw then. Now, the black knight gets an A for effort, but his foolhardy insistence upon ignoring the basic facts, well, ensure his defeat. To respond to the deep wounds in the American body politic, to say it's just a scratch, it's just a flesh wound, uh, is equally foolhardy. Healing, whether that be physical, psychological, or social healing, doesn't start until we admit there is a problem. No matter the results of the upcoming election, there is a wound in the national body politic. Saying it's only a flesh wound only makes the situation worse. The Greek philosopher Aristotle was insightful in a bunch of topics. We still use his formulation of ethics called virtue ethics from his book uh, Nicomachean Ethics, which was written way back in 340 BCE. He was on the ball a bit. In his book Politics, Aristotle claimed of the polis, P-O-L-I-S, where we get the word politics, right? Meaning the city or the state, the government arises in the polis to be for the sake of life and for the sake of a good life. First, just life. Second, a good life. Government arises. It is out of a simple human desire for safety. And then ideally, the polis goes on to the next level in which government ensures not merely the safety of its citizens, but also their well-being, their flourishing. Aristotle was probably incorrect about how government came to be. Anthropologist says, nah, that's not really how it happened. But I think his point still holds. Government is constituted, burdened, first and foremost, with the safety of its citizens, and then, ideally, with the flourishing and well-being of its citizens at a higher level. Remember the words of the U.S. Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to, one, form a more perfect union, two, establish justice, three, ensure domestic tranquility, four, provide for the common defense, five, promote the general welfare, six, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Now, Given Aristotle's definition and the clear intent of the framers of the Constitution, at least on this point, it isn't difficult to see that for many, if not most, American citizens, uh, well, our government is failing at the first assumption to merely protect the lives of citizens, let alone achieving that higher level of welfare and flourishing. In the streets of the U.S., we hear the cry, no justice, no peace, to which the reply from on high is, tis but a scratch. When we talk about wanting more civility and rationality in our political deliberations, like I did last week in my talk, it's easy for the privileged among us to forget that for many of our fellow citizens, politics is not about flourishing. It's about life and death. And for many Americans and for people trying to seek asylum in this nation, it's quite literally about life and death. And the government is not doing its job. For other Americans, the struggle feels like it's about life and death, uh, often for imagined reasons, but the fear is just as real for them. Uh, those perennial American fears of, they're, they're taking our freedoms, they're coming to get my guns, or whatever. And often emotions are triggered mentally. It, it comes in through the mind, but emotions don't stay in the mind. They become embodied, and they become fight or flight. 
For many Americans today on both sides of the political spectrum, it feels as if American political systems have failed to provide the most elemental reason for government. It's only a flesh wound is not an adequate answer from the right or from the left. Now, like most animals, we humans are highly affected by our surroundings and we can easily become vigilant and reactive if we sense that there's something threatening in our environment. Personally, I'm highly aware that my own self-calming mechanism is to contextualize a situation through reason and reflection. I can't say that's my first reaction, but it is a very immediate one. Because after all, I grew up as a Midwestern farmer and I have always identified as male. I've had it hammered into me all my life that reacting emotionally is extremely dangerous. Now, yeah, there are good reasons for that teaching among the people uh, in my social location. Uh, we had loaded guns around the house. We had livestock and large animals can be extremely dangerous if you react in suddenly or aggressively in any way. So the cliche was beaten into me. Farmers are calm, quiet, and rational. We farmers, we don't express emotions. Now, those of us who have spent time in therapy know that this is called sublimation. Natural reactions are natural reactions. They always will be our first reactions. The question is, if they come out, if they manifest themselves as natural reactions or somehow as sublimated or suppressed reactions. And look at the damage uh, that what I learned about emotional regulation, uh, think of what it's wrought in American culture. Recently, those suppressed emotions have led to an opioid crisis and what's now being called diseases of despair. Fact is, many people, not only Midwestern farmers like me, learn to sublimate or too often merely to suppress emotions so thoroughly that we lose, if we ever have acquired, the ability to differentiate one emotion from another. I've mentioned the term alexthymia before, the inability to in identify emotions. And guess who is the greatest, most likely people to have alexthymia? Poor, poorly educated men, like the people in my family of origin. Lisa Feldman Barrett is a professor and psychologist doing groundbreaking work on the emotions, and she writes this, quote, emotions are constructions of the world, not reactions to it, end quote. And this strikes me as an important and enlightening reversal of our traditional understanding of emotion. Yes, emotions are bodily sensations, but they are also culturally constructed. Midwestern farmers don't by nature have to live in a world of suppressed, confused, unnameable emotions, and neither do the other human beings on our planet. It's learned behavior. So let's think about anxiety for a moment. Let's say anxiety is the triggering emotion. I think there's a lot of it going around right now. It's an uncomfortable feeling. If I have no tools for managing anxiety, I may offload that emotion onto an easier to identify emotion. Um, anger, fear. Well, trigger warning, that's what leads to what we call to toxic masculinity. And yes, it's an epidemic. People socialized into the emotions I experience represent the extreme, but there are a lot of gradations of this behavior in a nation where our popular entertainment heroes are often violent vigilantes, in a nation where we have an estimated 393 million guns. Now, 
Let's imagine anxious people afraid of their own fear. How's that going to manifest itself? Well, my money is on anger. And anger, like lightning or electricity in general, is going to hit something. It's going to ground to something. And we have too many ambitious political leaders who are all too willing to name the object of the anger with a very simple-minded formula. Hey, you angry person, you are feeling the way you feel because of that. And in this scenario, we can forget about Aristotle's good life and merely wish our government existed for the sake of life, because too often it doesn't. Now, that's the scary part. In a few moments, I will consider the hopeful part. In part two, I want to consider the hopeful part. We can make clear-eyed decisions about that very dangerous wound in the American body politic. Our national wound is not a flesh wound. It's not a mere scratch, but we can figure out how to heal it. We do have the tools. Last week I talked about the old concept of a culture industry and I speculated that in contemporary America in the U.S. we have a bifurcated culture industry, a liberal culture industry and a conservative culture industry. And remember now that the word media is about intermediation. Liberal media is going to report the happenings in our world through a particular narrative, an intermediation, a story about those events. And conservative media is going to report the happenings in our world through an intermediation of a particular narrative, a story about the events. Both narratives will be run through the baffles and the echo chambers of liberal narratives and conservative narratives. And the outcomes, the reported results out of the media will reflect those initial biases. The products, the consumers of the two culture industries literally see reality in different ways. And so the New York Times will tell a story and QAnon will tell a story. Our pre-existing prejudices, if you will, choose between those narratives. I know, but you say, but wait, the New York Times is a reliable fact-based news source. Yeah, and many Americans will respond, that's what you think. Remember, it's not about reality. It's about impact. Last week I talked about an important work of philosophy, a dialectic of the Enlightenment, written by Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, two of the Frankfurt School philosophers. And I mentioned that Patrice Cullors, who is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, has read deeply in the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, and that tradition forms the foundation of the political theory of Black Lives Matter. Now, what I neglected to mention is that the connection between those Second World War generation uh, people like Adorno and Horkheimer and today is the African-American philosopher and activist uh, Angela Davis, who worked with another of the Frankfurt School philosophers, Herbert Marcuse, uh, who was her dissertation director. Now, I think just about every left-leaning liberal arts student of my generation joined Angela Davis in reading Herbert Marcuse's book titled One Dimensional Man Studies in the Ideology of Advanced Industrial Society. Uh, yeah, okay, that book convinced a generation to grow their hair long and wear colorful clothing, but it also diagnosed a very serious and ongoing American problem of media and the intermediation between actual events I mean, if there even are such things, right? And the spin most Americans get on those events. We are one dimensional, according to Marcuse, if we accept the output of the culture industry as truth. 
if we fail, in other words, to think for ourselves. Now, another of that later generation of the Frankfurt School philosophers is the German philosopher and sociologist Jürgen Habermas. Um, the UU Press, Beacon Press, publishes some of his books. Habermas's work also figures heavily into the thinking of Angela Davis and Patrice Cullors. Habermas is the person who coined the phrase public sphere. The public sphere is where conversation takes place. As I talked about last week, two-way conversation, not one-way pontification. Conversation as the answer is built into the very fabric of Black Lives Matter and humanism. It is in the public sphere where the din of conversation can occur. It's the place where opposing ideas may find a synthesis rather than mere opposition. It's the place that tyrants fear to tread, and it's the place tyrants fear for you to tread. It's the place and the method for talking the collective American psyche down from the ledge we are currently standing on. Now you see why Aristotle's idea about government is still valid today. It just makes sense that citizens are first and foremost made safe. But we in the United States, we haven't gotten there yet. Second, human flourishing for all citizens. That's a great idea, a common purpose. But at the moment, it's only a dream. But as I've said before, true hope isn't an emotion. It is a setting of intention. Hope is the setting of goals. And the humanist goal, first and foremost, is to achieve those two factions, functions of government, to pull them together for everyone so that we all live a shared life in a shared world. You've heard me define humanism a bunch of different ways. Uh, one of my favorite definitions, however, is humanism is an invitation to a conversation about the ongoing human projects of freedom and responsibility. Freedom and responsibility, ongoing conversation. We humanists invite everyone, all of our neighbors and fellow citizens, and all those who hope to become our neighbors and fellow citizens into a conversation, a conversation about how we can achieve together the goals for everyone, not just the few, for everyone, including those who are deeply in opposition to our vision. Democracy cannot exist in a situation in which one side wins and forces its ideas onto the other side, especially not in a nation where those two sides are so nearly 50-50. It's times such as those times we are living in that we do well to remind ourselves of the things that bind us together as citizens, all of us, and to think about those shared values we have. Can we agree that government exists first and foremost to ensure basic safety, life? Can we agree that government can and should encourage human flourishing on our planet? Yeah, first that uh, healthy uh, entree and then that dessert of flourishing. We don't have a scratch, we don't have a flesh wound. The United States is a deeply unjust nation today, but it also was in 1797 and in 1897. For progressives who believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice will never be won. It is an ongoing job of work. You know, a very amazing thing happened in the United States in March of 1797. President Washington packed up his stuff and left his office. And a new president, John Adams, moved his stuff in. Washington was beloved by the majority of Americans for his military leadership. Adams was seen by most as an officious oaf. 
It was the first time that Europeans exchanged power from one person to another who was not a relative without violence, without a coup, without a declaration of martial law. The two leaders were different religions. One was a slave owner, the other detested slavery. They disagreed on many things having to do with government. They didn't even like each other personally. Yet one leader walked out and another walked in and no blood was shared. U.S. citizens have managed that transition, if my count's right, 57 additional times, and only once was their blood. Nowadays, that sort of exchange happens all over the world, and it doesn't really feel like maybe much of a big deal, but U.S. citizens still live with the Constitution that created that amazingly mundane exchange of power. It's an invitation to conversation. It is a legacy for us to treasure and to live up to. Join me from home in our Extinguishing the Chalice words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. All of these we carry in our hearts and in our minds until we are together again. For every time your heart has been broken Forgive when you were denied your worth or your tokens Forgive, we all have our understandings One's pleasures, another's pain Let's open our understanding and live and let live and forgive, 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 and forgive, forgive. Don't carry the weight of hate for another Forgive, take hold of your heart and open it farther Forgive, this loving without condition Your neighbor as well as yourself requires a constant conviction to live and let live and forgive forgive oh forgive This loving without condition Your neighbor as well as yourself Requires a constant conviction To live and let live And forgive And forgive
Thanks for joining us today in this gathering virtually of the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. Thank you for helping us continue the work of Unitarian Universalist Humanism, which is the work of liberating all people. Until we meet again, in the words of the Unitarian abolitionist and transcendentalist minister Theodore Parker, be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. Its ritual, works of love. Its profession of faith, divine living. So may it be. Thanks for listening. You can find much more about humanism and what's happening at First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis by visiting our website at firstunitarian.org.